Oh. I nearly fell over. Warning, this video contains some colorful language. No, 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 I don't mean there's any swearing. It's just, it's a video all about words for colors. We're about to explore the origins of the words we use for all kinds of hues. What's the first color we came up with? Can black also mean white? Did the ancient Greeks really not have a word for blue? And which came first, the orange or orange? Stick around to find out. Welcome to another Rob Words. Well, the, the sun's come out. Now, before we begin, if you're looking for my video about why the Brits spell colour like that and the Americans spell colour like that, well, this isn't it. That's it. But basically, this American dictionary fellow called Noah Webster thought British spellings were rubbish, so he changed a few of them. Colour was among them. There you go. Saved you a click. Why not repay me the favour by clicking subscribe below? Right. Let's crack on. So you know how movies started off in black and white? Well, so did languages too. What I mean is that before coming up with words for any colours, we developed words for shades, for the darkest darks and the whitest whites. So let's begin with black. Its origins are actually a little murky, but the word is thought to have its roots over 4,000 years ago in Proto-Indo-European. That's the language that's our best guess at where the Indo-European languages originated. Some etymologists believe its origins are in the Proto-Indo-European bleg. I don't actually know exactly how you're supposed to say that. One of the meanings of which is to do with burning. The later Proto-Germanic word black as also meant burnt. What colour are things when they're charred and burnt? They're black. Black also shares its origins with another English word, blank which we get from the French word blanc. But hold on a second. Blanc in French means white. So what's going on there then? Well, before you throw any shade at me, is that how you use it? Um, let me explain how two words meaning the perfect opposite of one another manage to have the same root. So the old Germanic folk who were using the word black or something like it had a decisiveness problem. They all agreed that black meant burnt, but not on what burnt looked like. There was one camp that said it was the bright white colour of burning embers, and another that said it meant the dark, charred blackness of the aftermath. So the English ended up with black, meaning black, and the French got black, meaning white, but in the form of blanc. When English then took blanc from the French, they turned it into blank and also developed uh, the word bleach as well, meaning white. And um, then we also got the word bleak, which I don't know, to me is more of a dark word. Well, I don't know anymore. There's a danger of us falling down an etymological black hole, isn't there? Which brings me to something else. Old English had the word black, like I mentioned, but it also had another word for what we now call black, swart which is actually very close to these modern Germanic languages' common words for black. However, black and swart were not exactly the same. They draw a distinction that we've actually lost. So actually that makes it quite tricky to explain, but let me have a go. So imagine black as describing a place where there is no color, only darkness, whereas swart describes an object that is what we would call black. So, you know, a deep, dark cave would be black, but a burnt stick, a piece of coal, or I don't know what else is black, a black cat would be swart. Now let's pull ourselves out of this darkness and into some light and talk about white. Now white really is all goodness and light because it comes from the Proto-Indo-European quedo, which meant to shine. The K and H sound have swapped around a lot down the centuries and millennia in various European languages. T's and D's also like to swap themselves around too. So quados eventually enters Old English as wheat. Note the order of the H and W, which is still reflected in how snooty people pronounce white. An extra tasty nugget here is that the word wheat 
has the same root as white. By the time it was in Old English, the words were separate. We had huata, but wheat is so called because the old milled grains were white. Now, because not everything can be black and white, let's talk about grey. Grey itself, of course, uh, has its own grey area. If American viewers are watching this in some distress at the spelling there, I assure you it's not wrong. This is the standard British way of spelling grey. Our old pal Noah Webster can be blamed for your spelling being different. However, down the centuries, grey was spelt both ways in the British Isles. The reason is a goodie, actually. It's because it used to be spelt like that. After we lost that letter in the middle, ash, writers had to jump one way or the other. Some decided to keep the A bit and others went with the E. OK, so that's the shades sorted. Now let's shine a light on the words for the colours themselves. The question is, which order do we do them in? If only there was some naturally occurring sequence we could follow, an established progression, a spectrum, if you will. But I can't think of one, so let's do them alphabetically. Now, are there any beginning with A? Actually, I can't think of one, so let's skip straight to B, and not before time as well, because this one is actually a belter. Time for a bit of blue. Now, what colour could be more obvious than blue? On a clear day, we can be surrounded by it. Vast swathes of the Earth's surface are covered in it. We call our home the blue planet. But believe it or not, blue appears to be the last of the, I suppose, mainstream colours that languages develop. The ancient Egyptians only came up with their word after they started importing lapis dyes from Afghanistan, which were blue. And the ancient Greeks never got round to it at all. That's right, the ancient Greeks had no word for blue. How can that possibly be? Well, the thing is, blue appears very rarely in nature, actually. There are no blue flowers that haven't been made that way by human intervention. They're usually a variety of purple. And there are very few blue animals as well, just, you know, a few rare birds. And cultures, before they've developed their word for blue, appear to see the sea and the sky, the bluest things I can think of, as something else. Now, I know this sounds crazy, but it is true. The Greek author Homer consistently described the sea as wine dark. When was the last time you saw blue wine? And the Greeks also referred to the sky as bronze in reference to its shininess rather than its hue. What's more, studies have been done that suggest children struggle to describe the colour of the sky if they've never been told that it is blue. I hope that blew your mind like it blew mine. The sun's coming out. Back to etymology. The word blue, with the meaning it has for us today, came to English from Old French, although the French words bleu and bleu could also mean pale and discoloured and blonde among other things, so it's, it's confusing again. Before that, Old English had the word blau, which is very similar to the modern German word for blue, and that had its roots in an early Germanic word meaning bright. It also had the word hawen, I think it's pronounced, to describe the colour of the sea, and that encompassed the concepts of green, blue and grey, sort of all mixed into one, which I don't know if you've ever seen the North Sea, that sounds about right. Now, the North Sea is nothing like the beautiful azure colour of the Mediterranean, which brings me on to another thing that I did want to mention. First off, I've just realised that azure is a colour beginning with A, so I should have started with that. Never mind. Secondly, an Italian friend was telling me that to him and millions of other Italians, azure, or azzurro, is a separate colour to blue, or blue in Italian. In English, Azure is merely a shade of light blue. But when I said to my friend that, for example, the Italian football team wears blue, he said, no, they wear azzurro. Indeed, they're known as the azzurri. And he would never describe, he said, the sky on a clear day as blue. It's azzurro. Now, I thought this seemed ridiculous until I realised that we actually do exactly the same thing in English, but not with blue. We do it with pink. Pink is just light red, and yet we treat it as a separate colour from red. 
Well, the same goes with blu and azzurro. Next up, we're going down to brown town. Ah, sorry, I wish I hadn't said it like that. Now, the word brown had an illustrious start to life before it became the colour of mud and other unpleasant stuff. The Old English word brun and its ancestors meant shiny or bright, a meaning fossilised in the modern English word burnished, which means, you know, to polish. However, another meaning also took hold, equivalent to dusky or dark. And by the Middle English period, brown had completely lost its shine, and in around the 13th century, it had taken on the meaning that it has today, i.e. to describe things that are that colour, brown. Of course, brown things aren't all bad. What about lovely, life-giving trees? And that brings us nicely onto our next colour, green. Green has also been with us since Old English, meaning the colour of growing plants. In fact, the word green shares its etymological roots, if you'll excuse the pun, with other verdant words like grow, grass and graze. One of the oldest written records of it is actually from the year 1000, from a biblical poem that tells of Christianity's first man. Adam stop on green grass gasta gawodat, which meant Adam stopped on green grass, his soul made worthy. Those two words, green and grass, have the same etymological root. Okay, next, alphabetically, is orange. Now, would you believe me if I told you that the fruit came before the colour? Well, it's true. At least the fruit came before the word for the colour. We obviously had the colour orange before oranges, but in Old English, we called it yellow-red. And in Middle English, it was often called citrine or saffron. We get the word orange from Old French, where it was orange, or, or sometimes pomme d'orange, meaning orange apple. There's a common misconception that orange entered English as something more like norange, but became orange because people got confused between a norange and an orange. It's a surprisingly common phenomenon called rebracketing. I did a whole video about it. Anyway, with orange, this was not actually the case. It's true that through much of its etymological life, the fruit's name did have an N at the start, beginning in Sanskrit, through Persian, and into Arabic. And it still had that N when it reached Europe, hence the Spanish still calling it a naranja. But it's the Italians who appear to have dropped the N from the start for some reason, before passing the fruit onto the French, who in turn gave it to us. So the lack of N is not our fault. Anyway, after getting the fruit, we started using its vibrant colour as a reference point for other objects of a similar hue. So that's how the fruit can come first, and then the colour. You'd actually be surprised how often a colour is just the name of a plant. Pink is another one, named after a flower called pink. There's actually not a lot more to say about pink, and we've already concluded that pink doesn't deserve to be its own colour, right? It's just light red, remember? So uh, let's move on to another word that we get from the natural world, purple. Now the word purple originally comes from a shellfish that was known to the ancient Greeks as porphyra, and which yielded this beautiful, vivid dye. This stunning mix of blue and red was then known in Latin as purpura, but Clothes of that hue were worn by only the fanciest Romans, because it was very, very expensive. The word found its way into Old English as purpura, or purple, where it continued to be the colour of choice for kings and queens. And then, during the Middle English period, it became purple, and later still, purple, with its meaning widening out to go beyond that specific dye known as Tyrian, and onto all mixes of red and blue. And that brings to an end our purple patch. Now onto one of the big chromatic hitters. I just mentioned it, red. After black and white, the colour of blood is the first colour that languages tend to develop a word for. And you can see how our linguistic relationship with red goes way, way back. Just in the fact that words for red across Europe and beyond are remarkably similar. That's because they share an ancient common ancestor, again in Proto-Indo-European. From that same root, we also get the words rusty, ruddy, and ruby. 
There's also evidence of how red predates many of its colour counterparts in the fact that we refer to some people as redheads, even though their hair clearly isn't red. If we'd come up with the words sooner, we might have been calling them orange heads. Maybe. Anyway, moving on towards the end of the alphabet, we're finally at yellow. Now yellow is a weird one. If we look at other European words for yellow, none of them seem to come close to it. But let's actually just take a closer look at that last one, the German word gelb. The German gelb can be traced back to the Proto-Germanic gelwas. But if we follow another branch of gelwas's family tree, something interesting happens. We find ourselves in Old English. Then we find ourselves in Middle English, where it's sometimes written like that. Remember that first letter from my video about lost letters of the English alphabet? It's called a joch and uh, is sometimes pronounced like the ch at the end of joch, but also sometimes pronounced like the y at the start of joch. So suddenly the g sound we've had at the start of the word so far throughout its history turns into a y sound and we get yellow. And oh look, yellow. So as you've just seen, Yellow's ancestry goes back an awful long way indeed. In fact, you can trace it back to a Proto-Indo-European term meaning to shine. And on that bright note, we'll draw our chromatic crusade to an end. If I've missed off your favourite hue, tell me about it in the comments. And I'm also always really fascinated to hear about examples of interesting etymologies from other languages. Kindly hit the like and subscribe buttons and why not click the bell too? Oh, and uh, could you watch one of my other videos? Thanks. Until next time, take care.